This video is about Germany from 1918 to 1945 and it's one of the units in the OCR history GCSA. Before we talk about the wars we're going to talk about why Germany was so important. It's important because of four things. Land, empire, authority and people. And if you rearrange that you get pale. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Okay, why was Germany important because of land? It had lots of fertile farming land, industrial and military power and the second largest population of Europe. It had a massive empire with colonies in Africa and the Pacific. Its way of running things and authority and stuff was having a Kaiser and like an emperor of Germany, and that person had the most power, almost like a dictatorship. Its chief minister was chancellor, and the whole German parliament was known as the Reichstag. There was a really good welfare system, and there was a proud and healthy population. It's really important to know that the population was proud, because that's why Germans sort of were angry at the war guilt clause, which we come to later. This is a very, very basic overview of part of World War I. In early 1918, the Germans appeared to be winning, and they had a breakthrough on the Western Front with the Ludendorff Offensive. And then in June 1918, the Allies, which is the enemies of the Germans, were strengthened as the USA sent up more soldiers, and the Ludendorff Offensive sort of slowed and stopped, and it kind of failed. And in August 1918, the Allies counterattacked, claiming back land, and the German army just couldn't hold them back, which is why in September 1918, Germany lost and had to make peace. There were four main effects of the First World War on Germany. Physical, political, psychological, and anarchy. Physical is mainly the famine, because farming was disrupted by the war, because all the farms had gone off to help in the war effort, and so not enough food was grown, which led to thousands and thousands of deaths. 750,000 deaths due to hunger and disease. The Reichstag, which is the big political thing we learned about before, was weakened by the war, and Germany was also ruled by a military dictatorship, which was quite depressing for the Germans. But they thought it was quite good at the time, I think. Psychological, the war made Germans bitter and angry. They wanted someone to blame. They didn't feel that they were guilty. They were just upset that they'd been publicly humiliated. And anarchy, loads of armed, demobilised soldiers came home and they were obviously upset that they had been sent home from the war because they thought that they were doing quite well and there was a rumour going around that the war had been lost by weak politicians and stuff and this led to many violent demonstrations against the war and the Kaiser. One of the peace conditions that the Germans made with the Allies was that they'd get rid of the Kaiser and he refused to leave. And this is the basic chain of events of what happened and how he got forced out. So on the 25th of October, sailors mutinied against a suicidal move to fight the British. And from the 26th of October to the 5th of November, the army weren't sent in to crush the mutiny, so the mutiny continued. And there were many demonstrations throughout Germany against the war. On the 6th of November, soldier and worker councils took control in cities. And on the 7th of November, the Social Democrats sent an ultimation to the Kaiser, who told them, telling them basically to abdicate, which basically means leave, or else they would join the revolution and completely crush him. On the 8th of November, there was a general strike in Berlin with loads of armed people in the streets, quite a scary time. And the Social Democrats announced the abdication of the Kaiser, who hadn't actually abdicated, but they said he had, to make people believe that that was a good thing and stuff. And then on the 10th of November, Kaiser realised that he had to go, and he fled into exile in Holland, and Ebert, the leader of the Social Democrats, took charge. And on the 11th of November, an armistice was agreed between Germany and the Allies. At the end of the First World War, there were two big groups that wanted to control Germany, the left-wing revolutionaries and the Social Democrats. The left-wing revolutionaries wanted a real social revolution, and they didn't trust Ebert, because they thought he didn't actually want a revolution. They had a main group called the Spartacus League, who were led by Rose Luxemburg, who was a brilliant speaker and very respected. The Social Democrats believed that removing the Kaiser was the end of the revolution, and they didn't want to do anything else. They didn't want any extreme measures. They had some moderate Marxist ideas and they wanted to prevent a left-wing takeover. They had the support of the army and the Freikorps with the ex-army and they were led by Ebert. From 1918 to 1919 there was quite a bit of a power struggle between left-wing and social democrats. In December 1918 there were as many regular clashes between the government and revolutionaries and in, on the 5th of November 1919 the Spartacists, who were the left-wing revolutionaries, captured the headquarters of newspapers and capturing the headquarters of newspapers is really important because newspapers send the news out and if they capture the headquarters they can change the news and use it like propaganda. 
10th of January 1919, the Freikorps took over the Spartacus headquarters. And by the 5th of January 1919, the Freikorps had easily crushed the revolution and they killed Rosa Luxemburg. Sorry. And January to April 1919, the Freikorps continued to crush left-wing revolutionaries. Germany held a general election and the Social Democrats were the largest party and so Ebert was made the president of the new Weimar Republic. The Germans knew that they would have to do some stuff to make up for the war, but they did expect a non-harsh peace treaty because the Kaiser had gone and Germany was democratically elected as the Allies had wanted. The new republic needed support to become stable. President Wilson, who was one of the big people that dealt with all the treaties and stuff, believed in a fair treaty, and Germans felt that all countries shared blame for the war, not just Germany. Unfortunately for them, they were wrong. Sucks to be them. The Treaty of Versailles had many harsh factors. War guilt, military restrictions, reparations, territorial losses, and the League of Nations. The exam board seemed to love putting in this question, what did the Treaty of Versailles say, so I would learn this stuff. War guilt was Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, which said that Germany was to blame for causing the war. Obviously, Germans were very upset by this, they didn't feel they were to blame, and they didn't want to accept the responsibility of all these deaths. Military restrictions. The German armed forces were drastically reduced, which basically gave them no power, so they were really weakened by this Treaty of Versailles. Reparations. 6,600 million owed to other countries in annual instalments and they knew that this was going to have a dramatic effect on it, Germany because they weren't going to be able to afford it, they were going to have to cut down so much spending and it would really weaken the nation. Territorial losses, 13% of Germany's land containing 6 million people was lost and that's a lot of people to lose. And also the League of Nations, Germany wasn't allowed to join so it was like saying, oh you can't join us, we're too cool for you except Germany was sort of to blame for the war and that's why they weren't allowed to join. There was obviously a lot of fierce opposition to the treaty. The German leaders were forced to sign or the war would restart, but army leaders that were angry at the fact they were being forced to retreat spread a rumour that the war was lost by weak politicians. The army leaders felt that they'd been stabbed in the back by politicians and they encouraged this idea that the politicians were weak and they were to blame, not the army. All of these feelings of hatred culminated in the Kaputsch. By the way, if I'm saying any of this German stuff wrong, then just, sorry, I'm not a German person. I don't speak German. I, I took it for a year, but I ended up speaking French in the exam by the mistake, so a bit embarrassing. The army really hated the restrictions because many of them lost their jobs. They came home and they were really upset and a lot of them were angry, so they joined the Freikorps, which are ex-soldiers. The Allies were getting concerned by the size of unofficial forces and Germany was told to disband them and government did try to do this in March of 1920 but they kind of failed and Freikorps units that were led by Wolfgang Kapp, hence the treaty is called the Kapp Putsch, marched into Berlin and declared a new national government and the politicians were like, oh what do we do? So they appealed to the workers to help them by going on strike because if the workers were on strike it wouldn't really help the Kaputsch at all. So the workers all went on strike and the Kapp Putsch failed. Sorry, Kapp. But no one was actually punished because obviously the army who would have been doing the punishing, a lot of them were on the side of the Kaputsch, so no one actually got punished for that whole horrible business. Hitler joined the German Workers' Party in 1919 in November, and in 1920 he became the leader of the party and renamed it the Nazis, basically, which stands for the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Not quite sure how the G got in there, or the W, come to think of it, or the P. The National Socialist, I guess. And Hitler had a lot of main aims. The main aims were to rearm Germany and conquer Lebensraum. No idea on pronunciation there. To nationalise important industries, obviously to increase economic growth, grow a lot bigger. Just try to fight back against these horrible repayments. He wanted to create a strong central government that had power over the people. Destroy Marxism, the Weimar Republic, Weimar Republic even. I think it, that one's actually got a w, V. I don't think they have a W in German. It might be the other way around. The Weimar Republic, I don't know. And the Treaty of Versailles. It's because obviously he thought that was just some horrible treaty. He didn't agree with it and it was going to ruin all his plans. He wanted to remove Jews from positions of power and challenge of terror and violence with Nazis' own terror and violence to combat it and show off their power. The Nazi party had several key members, six in general big ones. So Adolf Hitler, who was the Nazi leader, confident, powerful speaker, who was meant to be Germany's saviour, but he wasn't. 
Joseph Goebbels, who was one of Hitler's most influential speakers, and he was a propaganda minister. And obviously propaganda, as we're going to learn later, had a massive impact. It was a big part of the Nazis' campaign to get power. Then there was Ernst Röhm, who was the tough leader of the SA until the Night of the Long Knives. He was gay. And, no, he actually was, so I'm not being offensive here. Um, Hermann Goering, who was leader of the SA from 1923, obviously after Rome had passed on, died, been murdered. There's not much else to say about him. We have Rudolf Hess, who had a really cool name, and was also a quiet man responsible for party administration. And Heinrich Himmler, who was pure evil, the SS leader who came up with the final solution. In case there were any things you didn't understand in there, the SA are stormtroopers, and they were like a bunch of thugs, basically, that Hitler used to break up meetings and stuff. And the SS, who started out as Hitler's private defence army sort of thing, and then they grew to have a more wide role, including running concentration camps and stuff like that. The Germans tried to design a new political system to form the Weimar Constitution, and there were several layers. There was the President, the Chancellor, the Reichstag, and the normal people. So a president was elected every seven years, and the president appoints a chancellor from the Reichstag, which is basically the parliament. The Reichstag was proportionally represented from the votes from the normal people. And there was also Article 48, which said that in an emergency the president could make up any laws which would basically make the president a virtual dictator. So it had many strengths. So Germans had equal rights, proportional representation was deemed fairer because everyone that got a vote would get a seat. A strong president was needed to control the new rapidly forming government, and each state did have some control over their own affairs. However, the Weimar Republic had enemies, and it wasn't sensible to give rights to those against it. No party could gain majority, so the government always had to be a weak coalition between parties that didn't really have the same beliefs. The president had too much power and could become a virtual dictator, as we said earlier, and states could be hostile to the national government and try to overthrow it, which would plunge the whole country back into chaos which would be really bad. In 1923, there were the three crises, which were the occupation of the Ruhr, inflation, and the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. The occupation of the Ruhr occurred because the Germans didn't keep up with their operations, and the French marched into the Ruhr, as they were quite legally allowed to do under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans passively resisted the French. They said, we were not going to work for you, you can do it yourself. And because Germany wasn't working for the French, they weren't paying back the French, they weren't working, so they weren't producing stuff to make themselves get richer. So Germany just became poorer and poorer. Because Germany couldn't afford passive resistance, it said, oh, we know what we're going to do, we're going to print more and more money. And guess what? That led to hyperinflation, which is when the value of money becomes near worthless, and that had really serious effects. People had saved for years, their life savings became worthless. There's a story you've probably heard of about the women in the basket, and they had a basket full of money, and they put it down for a second, and they came back, and the money was still there, but the basket had gone, because the basket had more worth than all the money in the basket. I remember that story. I got told it like 50 times at school. They kept forgetting they told it to us. Anyway, there was mass unemployment and poverty in Germany, and Germany scrapped the old money to stabilise the value of money, so it came up with a temporary currency, and then eventually it created a new currency. I think it's the Reichsmark, but that might have been the old one, so I'm not 100% sure. And the Munich Beer Hall Putsch occurred, which I wouldn't really class it as a big crisis, because it failed. But some people class it as a crisis, so we'll just say it is. In September of 1923, the Chancellor called off passive resistance and right-wing extremists were really angry at this weak move and planned a putsch in Munich, which is basically like a big revolution, march, that sort of thing, fight, and the putsch was easily crushed. This is a very, very basic overview of the Beer Hall putsch. Hitler tried to take power by starting a revolution in Munich. He told the SA they were going to rebel, told them to get prepared, be ready to fight. He then forced nationalist politicians, including a guy called Carr, to agree to rebel. And he did that by like holding a gun at their head and forcing them to say, we're going to rebel. The SA took over the army and newspaper headquarters, which obviously gives them a lot of power and leeway. And Hitler and the other Nazis went to Munich to march. But Carr had told the police, so the police were there, and they killed 16 Nazis, and Hitler fled and he was arrested two days later. And it's really annoying, because that seven is in orange rather than black, and that's going to bug me. So why did Hitler attempt to putsch in 1923? Well, the Nazi party was very strong with 55,000 members. The Weimar Republic... I keep saying Weimar, I'm pretty sure it's Weimar. The Weimar Republic was about to collapse. Sorry about all this mispronunciation. 
Hitler had the support of nationalists across Germany, or at least he thought he did, and his essay were bored and he wanted to give them something to do so that they didn't wander away from him. The big results of the failed putsch were that the Nazi party was banned and Hitler was banned from public speaking until 1927. He went to prison and he wrote Mein Kampf about his, all his beliefs, his anti-Jewish beliefs and his beliefs about power and stuff, and that was a bestseller, so that got his ideas out to a lot of people. Hitler also had a lot of time to think in jail, and he changed his strategy to gain power legitimately using Hitler Youth, propaganda campaigns, public meetings and local Nazi branches, and more moderate ideas to appeal to a much wider range of people. Other countries saw that Germany was struggling with all its different crises, and from 1924 to 1929, three plans were made to help Germany. So there was the Doors Plan in 1924, which was that loans from the USA were going to be invested into the economy. The Locarno Treaty in 1925, which meant that Germany accepted its borders and it joined the League of Nations, so it felt more involved in decisions and stuff. And the Young Plan, which reduced Germany's reparation payments, and that was in 1929, and it meant that the Germans owed less and that put less pressure on them financially. There were many big changes to German culture in the Weimar Republic. Painting showed everyday life and were known as new objectivity. I'm sure that means something, but I'm not sure what it is. Cinema, very advanced technology, many famous film stars, hotties of the day. Architecture, new style called the Bauhaus, uh, again, sorry about the pronunciation, which combined art and technology and it was also a very straight and neat and organised, I think. The theatre showed everyday life with an element of criticism of Germany and they had massive piles of money everywhere. And there was cabaret and nightlife, so it was vibrant nightclubs with dancing, a sense of freedom, loads of homosexuals and transsexuals and stuff like that. The Wall Street crash in 1929 led to the Americans recalling their loans and that led to extreme German poverty and affected many people. And it got worse and worse, particularly from 1930. Businesses closed, incomes fell because governments had to raise taxes, because they had to raise taxes to get more money to pay for the unemployed people who pay their benefits. Over half of people aged 16 to 30 were unemployed, and I think 60% of university graduates were also unemployed. The food prices kept falling, which increased the farmers' debts, and factory workers, 40% of them became unemployed by 1932, and the government was cutting benefits because they couldn't afford to pay so many people benefits, so it meant that all the unemployed people were suffering more as well. The Depression weakened the Weimar government loads. They had unpopular economic policies, presidential rule and the rise of extremism. The government had really little success reducing poverty. It had to raise tax and cut benefits and that basically made everyone unhappy because all the employed people were like, we don't want to pay more and all the unemployed people were like, you're taking away our money, our livelihood, our life, whatever they said in those days. All in German, of course. And obviously this was very popular and stuff. So that made everyone turn against the government. The Social Democrats withdrew from the coalition and Hindenburg, who was the Chancellor of the time, used Article 48, making him a virtual dictator, but he was controlled by business and army leaders, so he wasn't really in control, and people that were controlling him had their own interests at heart, so it was vested interests there. And there was a rise of extremism, because in times of desperation, people looked to the extreme. So communism and Marxism increased, as did political violence, which isn't very good. So how did the Depression help the Nazis? Well, Hitler seemed like an ideal solution to the weak leadership at Germany at the time, because he was meant to be strong and mighty and fierce and arrogant and all that stuff. Well, he wasn't meant to be arrogant, but all the other stuff he was meant to be, and they thought that would make a really strong, good leader. And the Nazis had designed all these work schemes that would combat unemployment, which would make everyone happy, because if there was less unemployment, benefits could go up and taxes could come down. And the Nazi stormtroopers promised to wipe out communism, which was something that everyone in Germany was unrealistically afraid of at the time. Everyone was just terrified of it, and it just seemed so unreal. Voting changes. In 1928, the Nazis had 12 seats. In 1930, the Nazis had 107 seats, which is obviously a lot more, making them the second largest party. And in 1932, the Nazis had over-doubled this to get 230 seats, which made them the largest party. The Nazis used a very wide variety of methods to gain votes, including organisation, propaganda, industrialists, technology, promises, flexibility, Hitler and opposition. The Nazis were really organised and skilled. They stirred up communist violence for the SA to crush, and that was propaganda because it made everyone think the SA were really strong and the communists were really bad 
it turned them away from the communists towards the SA and thus towards the Nazis. I got a use of thus in there. I get thus in like every exam and I sound like such an idiot. Industrialists, well Hitler made loads of cooperation deals with big businesses and they gave him money and funding and stuff and he supported them using policies that would help them out and stuff. Technology was something that Hitler took real advantage of that many other political parties didn't use and he used technology to mass produce propaganda, loads of posters everywhere, radios and that sort of thing. And it also allowed Hitler to travel from place to place so he could make speeches to whole towns and villages rather than them hearing him on the radio or whatever. Promises. The Nazis did make many promises, like to reduce unemployment, and they didn't actually keep to many of these promises, but they said they would, and everyone believed them, unfortunately. Flexibility. The Nazis dropped unpopular ideas to suit the voters, and a big example of this was euthanasia, because this got loads of criticism, so they dropped it. We'll come to that later. And Hitler was an exceptionally strong leader who faced little opposition, and people believed that he was the solution. They like, compared him to God and stuff, and no other party had such a good leader. Well, good in their weird, messed up minds. And opposition were very weak. They underestimated the Nazis, and there was very little they could do once the Nazis got into power. Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, and there were four main people involved in his role becoming Chancellor. There was President Hindenburg, who hated Hitler, had rich conservative industrialists as advisors, and I think he had a massive moustache as well. Then he had these two other people that had Von in their name, and I'm not quite sure why. There was Von Papen, who distrusted Hitler, was power-hungry and liked by Hindenburg, and Von Schleicher, who distrusted Hitler and was also power-hungry. And they both sort of had inward struggles, and they both didn't, they didn't like each other that much, and they wanted to like get one up on the other one. And then there was Hitler, who was the leader of the largest party, who would normally become Chancellor, but because everyone didn't like Hitler, they didn't give him this opportunity to start with. So if everyone hated Hitler, how did he get to become Chancellor in 1933? Well, in July of 1932, von Papen was made Chancellor, and he struggled with control. He had many issues. And so in December 1932, Hindenburg appointed von Schleicher as Chancellor instead. But von Schleicher struggled, and von Papen noticed this. And trying to get one up on von Schleicher, von Papen asked Hindenburg to make Hitler Chancellor instead, but Hindenburg, being sensible, said no. And then, a few days later, von Schleicher resigned as Chancellor. And Hindenburg wanted von Papen to be Chancellor, but von Papen didn't want to be Chancellor because he knew he had failed, but he still wanted to be in more control than von Schleicher. So he persuaded Hindenburg to appoint Hitler, and Hitler was appointed as Chancellor with von Papen as Vice-Chancellor. And it's all very confusing and you have no idea how many times I had to record that and re-record it because I kept messing up and saying Von Papen instead of Von Schleicher and vice versa. And they should have just had completely different names. Where's a Von even come What does Von even mean? I may have just gone on Google Translate and looked up that it means from. How nice. So how did Hitler use the Reichstag fire, which occurred on 27th of February 1933 and was basically when the Reichstag building burnt to the ground? Well... The Dutch communist found inside the building was used as evidence that the communists were plotting against the government. I think he was called, like, Van der Lube or something. I think there was Lube in it. I just checked and there was. And they used him as evidence that the communists were plotting against the government. There's many theories about what Van der Lube was actually doing. So, he, they, some people think that he started the fire himself, he was acting alone, and it wasn't a communist plot, and that's what he said, and he was executed. Uh, then there's that Van der Lube started the fire acting as part of the Communist Party because the Nazis claimed to find evidence at the homes of many Communists. And then the third theory is that the Nazis started the fire themselves and used Van der Lube to blame the Communists to use it for terror tactics and stuff. And 4,000 Communist leaders were arrested for conspiracy on the night of the Reichstag fire. Hitler persuaded Hindenburg to pass a decree to remove freedom so people lost their rights. And the police banned Communist meetings, which was obviously very good for the Nazis who could organise their campaigns to get votes, whereas communists couldn't. The Nazis used many tactics to try to get a majority vote, which they needed to pass the Enabling Act. We'll come on to what that is and all that stuff later. So they prevented other parties from campaigning. They arrested and imprisoned opposition politicians, which obviously turned the public against them. They were like, oh, we don't want to vote for people that have been in prison. <laughs> Hitler had been in prison, though. Anyway, uh, enemies of the Nazis could be executed. The SA could ransack homes of suspected opponents and obviously take stuff and ruin their campaign and 
burn stuff down or whatever they wanted to do. Many opponents were actually driven into exile because they were so terrified for their lives. And the Nazis intimidated voters by watching over them as they voted. And I think there's a source to do with this, so that might come up in the exam. So if you see all these Nazis surrounding the um, voting poll, you know what this is. Even after all this, the Nazis were still short on the two-thirds of seats they needed. So the Nazis banned the communists from serving, and this increased the proportion of the seats that Hitler had. It says he. It should say they, but I'm too lazy to change it. Sorry if there's typos in this. I've been doing a lot of these presentations, and I'm sort of dying. <laughs> and the Nazis intimidated the other parties to vote for the Enabling Act. So hopefully we're going to come on to what that is in the next slide. Yes, we are. The Nazis passed the Enabling Act, which meant that Hitler was a virtual dictator. Hitler had the power to make laws without the approval of the Reichstag or the President, which basically meant that the Reichstag had voted itself out of existence. Nice one, guys. Uh, the Reichstag had no say on policies, and the Weimar Republic was over, and the Nazi Revolution began. Dun, dun, dun. A power struggle developed in the Nazi leadership, and that was between the SA and the army, because they each wanted different things. The SA wanted to take over the army, have more power, and the army wanted the thuggish SA to be abolished. There were many reasons for choosing the SA over the army. They were larger, they had proved their loyalty in the Munich Putsch, they were committed Nazis, and they were led by Rome, who was one of Hitler's mates. And unfortunately, they were also getting a bit out of hand. Some of them disproved of some of the Nazi leaders. They had other demands that Hitler didn't really want to go along with. And some of the SA policies were extremist, and Hitler didn't like them. The army were well-trained, organised and disciplined. They had the power to remove Hitler. So if Hitler didn't go along with their demands, then they might have got rid of him, and that would have really messed up his plans. Uh, they had the support of important people, and he did need an efficient army to, to retake the land in the war. Unfortunately, the army was pretty small, with only 100,000 men. It had unknown loyalties, it hadn't actually proved its loyalty, as the SA had done in the Munich Putsch, and some of the army members disliked the Nazis. In the end, Hitler went along with the army, and on the 30th of June, quite a lot happened, and the 30th of June, 1934, was known as the Night of the Long Knives. I'm not quite sure why, maybe people used long knives, but that might be a bit too obvious, so maybe not. Hitler's friends, or more likely his workers, compiled hit lists of disloyal SA men, and the SS and the police went around and arrested dozens of SA leaders and shot them, or took them to camps for execution. Rome was jailed and shot the next day, and so was von Schleicher, who was that guy from that argument with von Papen, who was like, yeah, I'm going to get power. Well, he died, so guess not and over a thousand opponents were killed, which was really good for the Nazis, because that meant that they destroyed opposition. There was a massive element of fear spread throughout Germany, so people were like, we don't know what to do, and that causes panic, and panic means people turn to the extremes. Hitler made himself president and chancellor, and he also made himself head of the armed forces, who were swore an oath of loyalty to him. There's a really good source for an oath of loyalty as well, but I think that came up in a past paper, so that probably won't come up. So what were the Nazis' main aims? To have a loyal community with no anti-Nazi ideas, to have a strong rearmed army with a forceful and decisive leader, and to have a racially pure Germany with a master Aryan race. The Nazis ran Germany as a dictatorship because they didn't believe in democracy, felt it was weak, and blamed it for the fall of the Weimar Republic. They also had Hitler, who they wanted to use to press forward Nazi ideas, and having him as their dictator made him seem a bit more like God with total control. Nazis ran Germany as a one-party state, which meant that all groups were led by the Nazis to give them total control. For example, youth clubs like Hitler Youth and stuff like that. The Nazis ran Germany as an economic success. I'm not really sure if that makes sense, that sentence, but they tried to make Germany an economic success by ensuring that all people be strong with jobs and food. So they tried to keep good medical care, provide jobs and work schemes to come to that later, and make sure people ate. They ran Germany as a police state, with the SS and the police having total power to arrest and execute Nazi enemies. And also as a propaganda state, because the Nazis controlled what Germany saw and heard to influence them. And we come on to how they did this later, I think. So who actually had power in Germany? Well, there was Hitler, the dictator with the ability to make laws to suit himself. The SS and Himmler, who had the power to arrest and execute. Nazi party organisers, who had the power to spread Nazi ideas. Government ministries, which Hitler kept 
government organisations, she kept them there and left them because he thought they were doing well. Local Nazi party leaders who enforced laws but could interpret orders differently to suit their community. The army, who, like the SS, had the power to arrest and kill people, and they were also very well trained. And big businesses who backed Hitler financially, giving them Nazi support. I think the army and big businesses lost their power through time. I think the army lost it in 1938 and big businesses in 1937. The SS stands for Skustafel. I think that's how you pronounce it, but I've got no idea. And that translates to Protection Squadron or Defence Corps. And they were initially a private body of regard for Hitler, and they were led by the ruthless Heinrich Himmler. And they crushed the SA in the Night of the Long Knives. They were very large, with over 50,000 Darian men. And they terrorised and intimidated Germans into obedience. They had unlimited power to arrest people, ran concentration camps, and worked as secret police, preventing anti-Nazi messages. And they controlled the police, the courts and the prisons, so quite an important role. Although the Nazis did have quite a bit of control, there were ways that Germans could oppose Nazis. They could kill and imprison, well, obviously not kill and imprison, kill or imprison and replace Hitler. There were very few attempts to do this until the end of the war. We come on to that, the July bomb plot and stuff. But obviously that was quite risky, so that didn't really happen. Then you could openly oppose policies, which was very rare, but there was a lot of open opposition against euthanasia. Underground resistance, which is that some people came up with plans to defeat Nazis sort of out of the public eye, so they never really came to light, they never really took place, so they weren't really very much use. Then there was passive resistance, that many people refused to join the army or salute, and that could be punishable by death, so this was quite a strong message it sent out, this passive resistance. And then there was private grumbling, which was very common, as many Germanys disliked the Nazis but feared them, and you had all these jokes that they told. I would tell one now, but it probably wouldn't be very funny, <laughs> so I won't. Hitler had a really big issue. He had to decide whether to use or destroy the churches. There were many benefits to the churches. Church members voted for Hitler. Protestant pastors were Nazi election speakers, which helped to gain the Nazis' support. The Nazis and the church agreed on many things, such as the importance of the military and stuff like that. And churches were also local power bases, so the Nazis go to the church and spread loads of ideas within the church itself. Then there's problems with the churches, like that people wouldn't see Hitler as God if they were praying to actual God. And the churches also had more members than the Nazis, so they could take them over or something if they decided to. Religious beliefs were also very powerful and could conflict with Nazi views, such as euthanasia, obviously. Churches were like, no, we can't have that, and that was one of the Nazis' key beliefs. And church meetings could also be anti-Nazi and they could be used to spread anti-Nazi ideas, which is obviously one of the biggest fears of the Nazis. In 1933, the Catholic Church signed a concordat with Hitler, which basically said that the Vatican would leave him alone as long as he left the Vatican alone and stuff like that. But then in 1935, Nazis decided to take control of the churches and anti-Nazi ministers were arrested. In 1936, the Nazis pressured children not to attend church schools and that obviously stopped them from going and that stopped them from getting all these churchy ideas and they stopped beliefs in God and young people, which was really important to Nazis who wanted to have total control. In 1937, Christmas carols and nativity plays were banned in schools, so no one was singing. Well, you couldn't sing Christmas carols, you could sing other stuff, but Christmas carols are what you really want to sing. In 1938, priests were banned from teaching religious classes in schools, again, stopped religion spreading. And in 1939, all remaining church schools were abolished. So basically, the Nazis were very successful in controlling the churches. There was some religious opposition to the Nazis. Should I say oppositions or opposition? I think you should say opposition. I don't know why it says oppositions. But it doesn't really matter, because I should say there was some religious opposition to the Nazis. Sorry, I'm having a grammatical debate with myself over here. We we'll just have to ignore it and pretend it isn't there, however irritating it may be. Martin Neumoller was a Protestant who opposed German Christians and Nazis and formed his own church. He was put into a concentration camp. Paul Schneider was a Protestant, again publicly criticised the Nazis and was put in a concentration camp and killed. You can see there that Protestants were treated very badly. On the contrary, Catholics like Cardinal Galen, yes it's Galen, the same name Galen, how cool is that? <laughs> like from medicine. Yeah, it's not very cool. Yeah, he publicly attacked Nazis and criticised euthanasia, and that actually led to the Nazis reducing public euthanasia. And Joseph Fath, another Catholic, criticised Nazis and was let off. So they were treated very nicely, whereas Protestants treated badly, but not nearly as badly as Jehovah's Witnesses, who refused to follow Nazi beliefs, and one-third of them were killed. 
Sort of the Nazi ideas on desirable and undesirable Germans. Desirable Germans had blonde hair, blue eyes, they were tall, socially useful and intelligent. Undesirable Germans were unhealthy, disabled, mentally handicapped, tramps and beggars, homosexuals, religious minorities or gypsies. Or Jews. Obviously. Sorry if I spoke too fast, you can pause it and look at the words yourself if you can keep up. The Nazis tried to get a pure Aryan master race, and there were many ways they tried to do this. For example, by killing undesirables so that everyone was socially useful. The mentally disabled and diseased were all put together away from public view, so that the Germans sort of pretended they weren't actually there. Propaganda was used to support Nazi beliefs and to say, yeah, this is right, we should all be Aryan or whatever they wanted. And selective breeding was used to prevent Aryan race contamination. At some point, a law was introduced saying that Jews and Aryans couldn't give birth. Well, get together. You know, they couldn't breed. So that prevented Aryan race contamination by Jews. So how did the Nazis deal with their so-called burdens? Well, propaganda was used to stir up resentment against burdens. You have posters saying, these people are taking your taxes and, don't know, stuff like that on posters. On German, of course. And then people were like, oh, we don't want these people to take away our taxes. We don't like them. And then, obviously, if the government saw these people complaining about them, it meant they could do something and try to make themselves look good. Then there was the sterilisation law, which prevented undesirables from having children. That mainly focused on sterilising tramps and beggars. Concentration camps. By 1936, undesirables went to concentration camps, and most Germans welcomed this removal of undesirables. A lot of Germans didn't know what was going on in concentration camps. Euthanasia campaign. The Nazis were secretly exterminating mentally ill to save money, and they calculated like how much money they were saving and stuff. And this campaign was stopped in 1941 due to public protests. We're moving on now to the treatment of the Jews, and I'm sorry it's so small, I wanted to fit it all onto one page. In April 1933, there was an official one-day boycott of German Jewish businesses. There's a source on this, and it was called April Fool's or something, but I didn't know any of these stuff, because I didn't really revise very well, so I had no idea what it was on about. But that source could come up again, you never know. In 1934, there was a massive increase in anti-Jewish propaganda. In May 1935, Jews were forbidden from joining the army which obviously set them apart a bit. In September 1935, the Nuremberg Laws came out, and that completely ruined all the Jewish rights. The Jews didn't have rights anymore. In 1936, there was a lull in the anti-Jewish campaign because the Olympics were in Berlin, and Nazis obviously didn't want everyone to know what was going on. In September of 1937, Hitler made a spoken attack on Jews, and more and more Jewish businesses were closed. In April 1938, the Jews had to register property, which made it easier to confiscate. From June to July 1938, Jewish doctors, dentists and lawyers were forbidden from treating Aryans because the Nazis didn't want Aryans to be contaminated by the Jews touching them. In October 1938, Jews had to have a red J stamped to their passport. This obviously singled them out, made them different. From the 9th to 10th of November 1938, there was Kristallnacht. Act. I think we come on to that on the next slide. On the 12th of November 1938, Jewish property was damaged and Jews renting property faced heavy fines because they obviously had to pay for the property that was damaged. In December 1938, the remaining Jewish businesses were confiscated. In January 1939, Jews had to add a new first name. I think it was Sarah and Moses. Actually, I'm thinking I made up Moses. Is it Sarah and Abraham? Something like that. And Jewish emigration was encouraged. So they wanted Jews to leave the country. Just looked it up and the male Jewish name was Israel. And the female one was Sarah, as I said. On Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass, 91 Jews were killed and 30,000 were sent off to concentration camps. Jewish property was destroyed, with 400 synagogues and 7,500 Jewish shops being destroyed and burnt down and stuff. The Nazis planned Kristallnacht to satisfy the anti-Jewish hate in Germany and to shock Germany and show off the Nazi power. Hitler made sure it gained support by preventing the murders of non-German Jews, although I believe three were arrested, which angered Hitler quite a bit. They quenched all fires on German property and compensated any Germans that suffered as a result, and they also arrested looters to show that this wasn't an opportunity for all Germany to go mad, it was just to show the power and the anti-Jewish feeling. The Nazis used a variety of propaganda. It controlled the news, with all news publishers being taken over, anti-Nazi papers were banned, and the Nazis controlled the content of the papers and told people to read, so they were basically forced to read the Nazi beliefs. 
The Nazis controlled the radios and played them in public so that everyone could hear them, even those that couldn't afford a radio at home. Nazi films were played before real films in the cinema, so those who wanted to go and enjoy themselves at the cinema were forced to watch Nazi films showing Nazi beliefs, and that stimulated Nazi thoughts. People celebrated Nazism by flying Nazi flags and listening to Hitler's speeches at festivals. The Reich, the Reich, I don't know how you say it, Reich, Reich, Chamber of Culture. But that sounds a bit French, so I don't think it is that. Whatever it is, that was introduced, and only people that the Nazis approved of could show off their work. So that prevented anti-Nazi works from going on sale and going on show and stuff. So how was Hitler presented to the Germans? He was presented as a hard-working man who directed all his passion at Germany, but in reality he was actually an unreliable worker. He was presented as a man who abstained from ordinary pleasures. He was a vegetarian who was concerned about his health, it is true. He was presented as a generous man who refused his salary, but he didn't actually need his salary due to his Mein Kampf profits, and his face was also on stamps and he might have got some money from that too. He was presented as a man who was fond of children. This was true and a little creepy. He was presented as a brave man who fought valiantly in the First World War. He did fight in the war and underwent dental work without anaesthetic. Whether this actually shows that he's brave, I'm not so sure. I don't think it does. That said, the only dental work I've had was done with anaesthetic. I'm not quite sure why we always got into my dental work in these videos, because in the medicine one I think we discussed my teeth as well. I say we, I'm just talking to myself here. So, who was better off under the Nazis? Small businesses benefited because the Nazis banned department stores and Jewish businesses, which dramatically reduced competition. But there were still small businesses that were in competition with themselves. The Nazis wrote off farmers' debts and increased food prices, which increased the profits of farmers. Big businesses were paid to rearm Germany, which led to massive profits, and unskilled workers were put onto government programmes and given cheap flats. But the pay was poor and they had no choice because Nazis wanted all of Germany to be contributing to the economy. So on the last slide we said that German workers were forced to join work schemes, and there was lots of different schemes that the Nazis introduced. There was the German Workers' Front, which provided low-pay work for the unemployed, the beauty of labour, which tried to improve working conditions for workers. The Reich, I can't pronounce it, Reich, Reich labour circuit, that doesn't sound right though. The Reich, that sounds stupid. Whatever it is, whatever, Reich, Reich labour service, would you say it was that? And that's a compulsory six month scheme for all 18 to 25 year old males. And Sprint Through Joy, which organised holidays for workers. Obviously all of these would have German names, this is the sort of English translation. The Nazis' main economic aims were to reduce unemployment, rearmament and autarky. Reducing unemployment was really important because obviously it led to economic growth and stuff and made the country look better. But it was also quite difficult because exporting goods was hard due to the world trade collapse following the Wall Street crash. The Nazis were quite successful at reducing unemployment. To rearm Germany the, um, was another of the Nazis' main aims. And this was also hard because Germany was short of essential raw materials, but Hitler decided that he definitely had to rearm Germany because he needed to rearm Germany to be able to take on the other countries and start the next big war. The Nazis were successful at rearming Germany, but not quite as successful as they were at reducing unemployment. Autarky, otherwise known as self-sufficiency, was another of the Nazis' key tactics. Germany was over-reliant on imports and struggled to fend for itself, which is very unlucky for it. And it was decided by Hitler and the Nazis that Germany needed to be able to cope for itself during the war and stuff. And unfortunately, the, well, I don't know whether it's unfortunate, but the Nazis were unsuccessful at promoting and getting autarky. So they kind of failed at that. So how did the Nazis try to fill their economic objectives? Well, there was the new plan and the four-year plan. The new year, ugh, I just said the new year plan, mixing the two up a bit there. The new plan was by Dr. Schnatt or however you pronounce his name, and that limited imports and arranged all trade in advance. Government spending was channelled into many industries, so it helped lots of people, and unemployment was reduced through the work creation projects we saw before. Towards the end of the new plan, Hitler said he wanted more focus on rearmament, and Dr Schnatt said he couldn't do it because it would cost too much, and Dr Schnatt ended up in a concentration camp. The four-year plan was devised by Goering, who was one of Hitler's right-hand men and this increased production of raw materials and synthetic raw materials which were needed for rearmament. It reduced imports and tightened controls on wages and prices so that Nazis had more control over the money and people's income and what they're spending and stuff. 
and it also used forced labour where needed through work schemes again. So what was the Nazi youth policy? The Nazi youth policy indoctrinated children to believe in Nazism, which basically means they changed the beliefs of children and they messed with their minds and stuff and brainwashed them to believe that Nazism was the right thing. Boys were trained as soldiers and girls were trained as housewives and mothers. The Nazis changed education to reflect their ideas. For example, biology you might be studying Aryan and Jewish skulls and seeing the differences. And in maths you might be calculating how much money could be saved through the euthanasia or every the verb in that tense is of disabled. Then Jews in schools were ostracised and victimised and they essentially got expelled. And, but I don't know when that was, I think it was 1938. Rings a bell, but might not have been. And leisure time for youths was filled with Nazi ideas like youth clubs like Hitler Youth, which was compulsory in 1936. The female version of this, I think it was called the German League of Maidens. The Nazis did face some resistance from youths. The best leaders of Hitler Youth joined the army as soldiers, and so Hitler Youth was left to be run by teenagers, and that focused on military tactics, which bored many children who got fed up and they left to join other groups. And there were three big other groups, Swing Youth, Edelweiss Pirates, and the White Rose Group. Swing Youth was run by middle-class youths who enjoyed dancing and jazz, wore British clothes, accepted Jews, and were generally hated by Nazis. The Edelweiss pirates were working class youths who directly opposed Nazis. They attacked the military, beat up Hitler youth, and I think they killed a member of the Gestapo. They were punished very harshly. The White Rose Group were Munich students who distributed anti-Nazi leaflets. I think they were led by Sophie Schlin Schlin Schlindler, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, but don't quote me on that. And most of the leaders were caught and killed. The Nazi policy towards women was Kinderkutsch Kutsch. And I spent many years trying to work out what they meant, because I didn't study German. Well, I did, but I wasn't very good at it. But finally, when we came to this lesson, I finally understood. And Kinder means children, Kutsch uh, means kitchen, and Kutsch means church. And when you look at them, it's kind of obvious they meant that all along, and I was just being really thick. <laughs> anyway, children were needed to increase the Aryan master race. Obviously, only Aryan children were desired by the Nazis. Kitchen, basically, women were encouraged to cook using leftovers to... Present, present, wait, present, prevent waste and stuff like that and women were encouraged to go to church to hear Nazi views and to become more indoctrinated and stuff. Nazis encouraged reproduction and housewiving. I made up that word. I don't think it exists. Don't use it. For example, Aryans with lots of children were given benefits and you could get medals and stuff and there was this woman that the Nazis like full on bummed off and she had had loads of kids and they were like, look at this woman. Uh, contraception and abortion were banned very controversial, obviously. Non-Aryans were not allowed to reproduce, and there was absolutely no Aryan and Jewish relations allowed. Women were made redundant, and marriages were encouraged and divorces banned. That's to prevent couples from splitting up. But you were allowed to get a divorce, actually. If one member of the couple was unable to have kids, then you could get a divorce. The next four slides are a basic overview of the Second World War and you'll be glad to see this one is pretty empty. From 1939 to 1941, the war was going really well. Rationing was introduced, and Germans ate well, and Germany conquered loads of other countries, and they thought they were going to do it. From 1941 to 1943, Hitler ordered the invasion of the Soviet Union. The army became bogged down, and the war was going badly. In Germany, propaganda campaigns were launched to try to keep up morale. Yeah, try. From 1943 to 1944, the war was going very badly, and the government prepared for total war, which is when everything in Germany is geared towards the war effort, and they don't really care about anything else. It's all about the war, fighting for it. So all factories and stuff, you didn't do anything unless it was for the war. So non-essential businesses were just shut down altogether. The propaganda campaigns continued. There was many air raids, which destroyed loads of buildings and made people really worried. Jews and political prisoners were kept in concentration camps, and some prisoners were used in factories and on farms as slaves. From 1944 to 1945, the Germans were being crushed. Air raids were destroying factories and homes. Nazi administration couldn't cope with the destruction. The government was thrown into chaos. There was mass poverty throughout Germany. And finally, in 1945... Hitler and Goering and other Nazi leaders committed suicide in Berlin, which ended the war. Hooray! So how did the war affect women? In the war there was more pressure on women to have children because the Nazis thought the war was going to go on for a long time and they were going to need loads of soldiers in the future. 
Life was difficult for mothers who didn't want to have more children due to absent fathers and rationing, but they were under so much pressure from the government to do so. In 1943, the Nazis tried to mobilise women, but many refused. They tried to mobilise, I think, three million women, uh, basically give them jobs and stuff, but only one million women actually went, and the rest pretended to be ill or got pregnant on purpose. I'm not quite sure how they did that, given that their husbands were fighting in the army, but they did. And Nazi leaders were actually really worried that women would outnumber men because men were dying in the war. And they came up with some idea that in the future men were going to be able to have multiple wives. That didn't come about, thankfully. Obviously Jews were one of the big groups that were affected massively by the war. The treatment of the Jews worsened dramatically in 1941 with the Soviet Union attempted invasion. The SS soldiers were sent in to murder as many Jews as possible, and the Nazi leaders decided on the final solution of killing all the Jews. I think that was fought up of by Himmler. Jews were moved to death camps where they were worked to death or gassed, and in the war nearly six million Jews were killed. The July bomb plot was the closest that anyone came to killing Hitler, and that occurred in July, obviously, of 1944. And it was by von Stauffenberg, who was seriously wounded in 1942 and wanted revenge on Hitler. And together with his friends, General Beck and Dr. Godel, um, they planned to assassinate Hitler. And they kept plotting for a long time. He kept going to meetings with his bombs, but Hitler always left early or something like that, so he couldn't set them off. And then on the 20th of July, 1944, von Stauffenberg planted a bomb near Hitler, but then someone kicked it. I think it was Colonel Brandt, or whatever he was called. He kicked it with his foot and he moved it, and that put it behind a leg, is that what you call them? Legs of tables? A big, thick leg. So when it went off, it didn't actually kill Hitler. And Van Straffenberg had long gone by then. He went to do some rebellion in Berlin, but that failed and he got executed. So that was unfortunate. And that is the end of the Germany part of the history course. Yay! Sorry for the lack of jokes. I couldn't really put them in. It wasn't really appropriate. So it might have seemed really boring, but hopefully it helped if you actually got here. But no one's actually got here. I'm barely here. You can hear my voices going. <laughs> but yeah, well done.